Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today for this webinar. We will go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk about a functional safety certificate, what it all means and how it can relate to you. My name is Lauren Stewart. I'm a CFSE. I work here at Exeter with our focusing on mainly our mechanical customers. Um, I work in helping our customers achieve SIL certification through the safety case, the audit, the FMEDA. And I also help with Exeter research with failure rates, 2H, and stiction. Quickly, who we are. We have offices all over the world. I like to say no matter where you are or where your customers are, we have someone close by to help with any of your functional safety needs, whether that is process safety, alarm management, or cybersecurity services. Exeter is involved with the complete supply chain of functional safety in multiple different industry sectors. Um, you can go ahead and start in the in original equipment manufacturers or the OEMs, the whole way through to the end user. We have tools, software, training, engineering, consulting, um, services, anything that's related to functional safety, security, and reliability, we're here to help. We have engineering and consulting services in functional safety or process safety, alarm management, and cybersecurity. We have engineering tools and our engineering tools are to help you save time and money while increasing efficiency and productivity. So these software tools can help you do PHAs, LOPAs, SIL selection and verification, SRS creation, proof test procedures, alarm rationalization, and cyber risk assessment. So anything dealing with functional safety, we have software to help you along with that process as well. We're going to talk a lot about Exeter certification today. Um, we have certification in IEC 61508 and 511. We also have ISO 26262 certification and tool qualification. We have our ISA secure or our cybersecurity certification. We have IEC 62061 machinery certification and personnel certification, which is the CFSE program. But today we're going to really focus in on the IEC 61508 and 511 certification. And what we're going to look at is all of the information on the certificate. So you're about ready to buy a certified product and you're presented a certificate. Well, there's a lot of information thrown on that certificate, and a lot of it is very important. So we're going to help you interpret what all of that information need, means, know, help you to know what to look for, how to interpret the product, if it's actually going to suit your needs or not, as well as looking at examples and showing you how to spot a fake certificate. To do this bestly, we're going to first look at what happens in an Exodus certification. Then we're going to look at the different certificate sections. First being the scope assessment level revision and expiration. Then we're going to look at the main conformity declaration section. We're then going to look at the certificate template, then the failure rate and support documentation portion of the certificate. Then we're going to look at how to interpret the certificates and look at a couple of different examples. And look at certificate validity, um, how to know what to look for and how to spot a fake. 
And then finally, we're going to look at how that certificate relates to compliance for you, the end user. So to start off, we are just going to quickly look at what happens in an Exeta certification. Certification process isn't um, an easy or a trivial thing. That's why the certificate has so much information on it. Um, the process goes through a lot of requirements from the standard, a lot of information. So we want to convey as much as we can on that certificate to you. The certification is always going to start with a kickoff meeting. We're going to find out if it is a proven in use justification and looking at field return and shipment data. We're going to look at if it's a new product in the field. We would then look at validation and verification, um, test plan and test results. So all of that information is going to be conveyed in that kickoff meeting. From there, we take um, the drawing and bill of material and perform an FMEDA. That is a failure modes effect in diagnostic analysis on the product itself. We will break the product apart line item by line item of the bill of material and see how if each component breaks, how that will relate to the functional safety of the device. So if that seal does no, no longer seals, what will happen? Will the device still be able to perform its job when needed? From that FMEDA analysis, you are going to receive failure rates of the product. Those failure rates, we're going to look at what those failure rates look at like and where they are on the certificate later. We're going to then, if it's a proven in use analysis, do that proven in use justification. If it is not, then we will look at the verification and validation test plan results. We're going to go through the process analysis. We're going to go through the quality system, how modifications are made, the product brochures, the safety manuals, the IOM, all of that information. And we're going to line it up with all of the requirements of IEC 61508, if that's what they're being um, certified to. Then we do an on-site audit. We'll make, at this point, answer any questions that we have, see if there's anything missing. If um, we'll do a tour of the plant, make sure that everything looks good. And then if all of that is completed and the assessor is happy, they will create a safety case and pass it along to a separate, completely independent certifier. If that independent person then goes through and if they have any questions, they can ask the first auditor to get more information. If not, and they find the um, safety case is complete, then and only then, both auditors will sign off on the project and you, the manufacturer, will be given an assessment report and a certificate. That, that certificate that is at the very end of the process looks like this. As you can see, it's broken down into four main sections. Um, you will have the front being the left two sections and the back of the certificate being the right two sections. The leftmost being the first section that we're going to talk about today, the scope assessment level, the revision, and the expiration. Then we're going to move on to the main conformity declaration. That's the main portion of the front of the certificate. That has a lot of information in it, so we're going to spend a little longer time on that portion. Then we move to the back of the certificate. We're going to look at the certificate certification template and what that means and then look at the failure rates and supporting documentation section of the certificate or the main portion of the back of the certificate. 
As I said, the first section we're going to look at is the scope, the assessment level, the revision, and the expiration. At the very, very bottom here, you can see in blue, there's two logos on our newest template. That is an ANSI logo and an IAF logo. And the IAF is the International Accreditation Forum. And that is a worldwide program and they come through and audit the assessment program that we have. In the United States, the branch is ANSI. Um, there's other branches in other countries, such as the UK, the Netherlands, Germany, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. Many, many more have their own branch. So you might not necessarily see ANSI if you are doing a certificate from a German company, but you would always need to look for some type of IAF accreditation program. What ANSI does, we just finished up our audit yesterday, um, they come in and audit us to make sure that our assessment program is accredited, that we are doing the right things, that we are doing what we say we're going to be doing, all of that so it's not just us deciding we're good enough to present certificates out there and judge other people. No, we're actually being judged to make sure that we are accredited to do so as well. So no matter who you are looking at a cert from, always make sure that the certificate is marked with either ANSI or IAF or if it's in the UK, the UKAS, any one of those logos, along with the certification body number. Ours, as you can see at the bottom there, is 1004. That is our certification body number from ANSI. And if we are doing an assessment that follows the ANSI accredited assessment program, our number and their logo will be on our certificate. So and that's a very important thing to always look for. Next, above that, is the big circle in the middle. And that is the scope and the assessment level. As you can see, the circle says it is a certified device, it's certified by Exeter, per IEC 61508, and this is a SIL-3 capable device. That has a lot of information just in one symbol. Um, this shows that it is, the product was evaluated per IEC 61508 requirements and that the SIL-3 requirements were met. And that this product has passed Exeter's assessment scheme up to at least the SIL-3 capability level. So this certification mark is showing the achieved assessment level. Under the certification mark, we have the revision and the expiration. All Exeter certificates will expire. When we issue a, cert a certificate, we're going to have the revision, the date that it was released, along with when the next surveillance audit is due. And this certificate is valid until that sur um, surveillance audit due date, and that's when the certificate expires. When a certificate is achieved, it is going to be published on the SAEL, and we're going to show you how to do the SAEL, um, what to look for on that later. If at the end of three years, when the surveillance audit is due, we will then go and ask them if they've made any modifications to the product. And this isn't just we changed the paint color. This is a major change to the product. We're going to ask if any of their procedures or documentation have changed. Um, we're going to look 
at if they made modifications, if they're doing an impact analysis. We're going to go back and audit and see on site. So there's a lot of things that are done in this surveillance period. Once that surveillance audit is completed, then a new certificate will be updated with a higher revision. And then that new certificate will then be posted on the SAEL website and that new certificate will then be given out to um, any end user that's asking to purchase their product. If there is no expiration date, that means that the manufacturer is not allowed to make any changes to the product without a, re, a full recertification. That means we either did not evaluate their modification process or their modification process did not meet all of the requirements of IEC 61508. The next section is the main conformity declaration, and this is the main portion of the front of the certificate. So the first key piece of information is going to be the certificate number, and this certificate number is going to be unique for every single certificate that has been issued, not just every manufacturer, but every certificate that Exeter has issued. It's always going to start with three letters that followed by seven numbers, followed by the letter C, and then three numbers. Underneath that certificate number is going to be the product and the manufacturer. If a product is sold by multiple manufacturers, that doesn't mean that, well, manufacturer A has a certificate, that means manufacturer B, C, and D will also fall under this certificate. That's not the case. Um, the different manufacturers can have a different return process. They could have different customer for notification process. They can have different suppliers. There's all these different quality processes and quality documents that could differ between site to site. So there we would list not only the product name and the manufacturer but also the site if a certain site was evaluated and not the others. Under that we're then going to list whatever standards and assessment levels that were considered when doing the assessment. As this example shows this one was done per IEC 61508, the 2010 version of the standards, part one through seven. And this has a lot of information in it. You want to make sure that you know what standard has been evaluated and what the cert has been evaluated per what standard. You if you're using the new version of the standard, you don't want to have a certificate using that was obsessed with the old version of the standard. Um, parts five, six, and seven are informative, but they're still being considered as part of the assessment. And part three is software based, but we even if it's a simple mechanical device such as a ball valve as this example, we're still going to say we considered part three but the, um, the coding or the software based um, requirements were not applicable. But we didn't just completely not consider part three. IEC 61508 is contains many different portions of the standard. It's showing that you're going to comply with the development process, the quality system requirements, and also the product specific performance requirements. That's why you want to make sure that all of the portions of the standard were thought about and assessed. 
Under that comes the systematic capability. Systematic capability is that quality, those procedures, those documents, how modifications are going to make, be made. All of that information is in the systematic capability. When we do the assessment, we break apart all of the requirements in the standard and go line item by line item to make sure that all of the requirements are going to be met. The higher the SIL capability or SIL level requirement that you have, the more requirements that are going to be in the standard. Um, just for example, if you're going to look at a software-based product, fault detection. Fault detection is not required for SIL 1. It's recommended for SIL 2 and highly recommended for SIL 3. So if we're just looking at a SIL 1 capable device, we're not going to look through fault detection. But if we are going to say something is a SIL 3 capable device, we are going to look at fault detection. So that's a, where systematic capability comes into play. If this product is capable up to a SIL 3 capability, or SC3, that means that the product can be used in a SIL 3, a SIL 2, and a SIL 1 application. However, if you have a SIL 2 capable product, it can be used in SIL 2 or SIL 1. It cannot be increased to the SIL 3, no matter how many you stick in there. And a key thing to know about systematic capability is just because something says it is SIL 3 capable does not mean it can be used without any redundancy in a SIL 3 application. No, it just means that the quality, the documents, the procedures, every the modifications, all of that, the requirements, all of the requirements for SIL 3 have been met. You still need to look at the failure rates. You still need to do your calculations. You still need to consider your PFD and your architecture. So that's not something that you say, this is SIL 3, I can just throw it in and forget about it. No, this just means that this has a chance of working in your SIF or your system. Under systematic capability comes your random capability. And this is where systematic was the quality. Random is going to be for performance, for the product specific performance requirements. We're going to be talking about um, your probability of failure for the entire SIF. We're going to be talking about minimum hardware fault tolerance if it's an element. So this is where failure rates come into play. It's also going to let you know if it's a type A or type B device. A type A is going to be your simple mechanical devices, where type B is going to be your more smart devices. It's going to say if it was evaluated per Route 1H or Route 2H. While Route 1H is going to be your safe failure fraction, while Route 2H is going to be a proven in use justification. And all of this information is given to you in this random capability section. One thing to note is, and we're going to talk about this later as well, but I want to bring it up here. When you are talking about PFD average, or your average probability of failure on demand, or your probability of failure per hour. If you are only looking at a single device, you cannot be, you should not be given an av PFD average number. That PFD average is something that has many, many variables. I think it is nine separate variables, which seven are controlled by the end user. Things like your maintenance capability, how often you're going to proof test. Um, if you're going to run through the whole proof test or just 
partial valve stroke tests. That type of information is going to be controlled by you. And it is something that the manufacturers, they can use assumptions in the variables, but it's dangerous to use assumptions and not list what all of those assumptions are in the PFD. So we very much recommend to leave that up to the end users because you know your maintenance, you know your architecture, you know how you're going to proof test your SIF. So that must be um, considered and verified for each application. Another portion of the front of a certificate is safety functions and application restrictions. This is going to be right above the signatures and below the systematic and random capability. This is going to say what was considered to be the product's safety function when it was being certified. And the certificate is only valid, and the whole certification process is only valid if that product is used within the constraints of that safety function. For example, say you have your shutoff valve. Most likely, it's only going to be certified for on-off applications. It's not going to be um, control function applications. And this is where, in the safety function, where that's going to be listed. Under that is the um, product specific applications. This could be environmental limits. This could be anything that might limit the product's use. And normally these are all going to be listed in the product's safety manual or IOM. And we're gonna talk more about safety manuals and IOMs later. Finally, at the bottom of the front of the certificate, you are going to see two lovely signatures. As I mentioned earlier, our assessment scheme requires two independent assessors to evaluate the product's compliance. You have your evaluating assessor that does most of the work. They're going to do the FAMIDA, they're going to do the safety case, they're going to look at any detailed review of the quality system, a detailed review of the design requirements, all of that information is going to be assessed and signed off by an evaluating assessor. Once they are completely done, they bundle it up in a nice safety case and send it off to a certifying assessor. This assessor has not seen anything of the uh, product or the assessment yet. This is a completely independent review. They're going to look at the product, going to look at the development and the process and the quality system. And then if they agree that all of the requirements are met, then the certifying assessor will sign off on the safety case as well. If and only if both assessors sign off on the assessment, then the certificate and assessment report are created. If one of the assessors do not agree, then a certificate will not be made. Now we're going to move to the back of the certificate and we're going to start with the certificate template. This is going to be at the bottom of the gray bar of the back. Um, we are continuously being evaluated by our um, our Exeter board um, is made up of a lot of end users and we always get suggestions on how to make things better. We're always makes things better through our ANSI audit. So there are times we change our certificates and always look at the revision. You might have two different Exeter certificates and they look different, but that might be, the different revision might be why they look different. So even if you have two certificates that are slightly different, they still both may be valid. Just look at the revisions and that might explain something. Next, we're going to move to the main white section of the back of the certificate. And this has very, very important information. This has failure rate and supporting documentation information for you. On the back you're going to see a failure rate box. 
First, you're going to look at, on the left hand side, you're going to see the applications. Whether it is, say this is for a valve, you're going to have full stroke, maybe full stroke, tight shut off, and open on trip application. There's many different applications that you can be configured along with clean service or severe service. You could have something that is supposed to be in a very corrosive environment. In that case, you're going to need to use the severe service numbers instead of the clean service, cabinet mounted, you know, it's all pretty and pristine. Also, take into consideration if you're going to be operating in normal or partial valve stroke testing on the device. So any way that this device was evaluated is going to be listed in, under the application. To the right, you're going to have failure rates and they're broken up into safe detected, safe undetected, dangerous detected, and dangerous undetected categories. And per each application, you're going to have safe and dangerous detected and undetected failure rates. We talked about briefly about the average probability of failure on demand numbers. And that calculation depends on a vast number of different parameters such as proof test interval, the proof test coverage, your mission time, maintenance capability, all of that comes into play and many of those variables are not going to be able to be controlled by a manufacturer. So publishing that probability of failure on demand number implies mandatory test intervals and procedures. So we often suggest that those probability of failure on demand numbers either not be published at all or the end user do the final determination of that number because you're going to have control over many of those variables. And you can calculate that number from the failure rates given on the back of the certificate here. One thing to note is failure rates and if they are too optimistic or not. We often, not often, but we occasionally see failure rates that are too good to be true. And I always say no matter who you get the certificate from, Exeter, from a manufacturer themselves, from a different certifying body, always double check. Especially if these are going into safety systems, you want to make sure that your calculations are going to actually be what happens. So how do you know what's going to be good failure rates and what is going to be a bogus failure rate? Well, there's a website called sillsafedata.com and this website gives you kind of your sanity check. It gives you a lower bound and an upper bound per different type of um, final element because the final elements we were seeing the most um, overly optimistic failure rates from. This is a free website. You can just pull it up on your phone if you're out in the field or if you're at your desk doing a calculation and something seems a little fishy. Some, you receive a certificate and it's telling you that you can put a valve out in a field and you don't have to look at it for 5,000 years. You never have to do a proof test. You never have to um, maintenance it. You can just put it in, forget about it, and in a one out of one system, in a SIL-3 um, SIF. You're thinking, wow, this must be the best valve ever created. Well, if it's an order of magnitude below every single thing else out in the market, our advice to you is question it. Come to this website and if you receive, let's just take that top line, you're going to look at in pneumatic piston spring return actuator. 
if the lower bounds on CellSafe data is 190 fits and you receive a certificate that is saying your actuator is can be capable of a two fit throw some red flags um, ask some more questions ask to see the assessment report and say how did you get this number same goes for the high bounds um, if you receive an actuator and it has a high bound if it has a thing of 5,000 fits you can see that even generics usually fall within that high bound range of sillsafedata.com maybe you can use um, numbers that aren't nearly as conservative in your calculations and maybe that will be helpful to you as well so if you have questions about data integrity um, this is a great website to bounce ideas off of and do data checks with underneath the failure rate tables you're going to have your supporting documentation this is going to list the assessment report number and your safety manual number and the assessment report along with the certificate is always posted on the SAEL and you can do a lot of fun things with this whether you are searching for a manufacturer or you're searching for a specific product or you can even say I'm searching for a final element a ball valve and you can list all of the ball valves that have been certified and once you pick one you can click on it you can then pull up the certificate itself both the front and the back so you can look at the failure rates and then you can also pull up the assessment report and the assessment report is going to give you information on everything on how the modifications were looked at and addressed that what documents were assessed in the assessment of this product all of that information including how the product um, the failure rates were um, achieved whether it was through something like an FMEDA and predictive analysis or if it was through something say cycle testing or a B10 data point and this assessment report will let you look and see if your application is suitable for this device um, for example if you have a SIF a safety function in um, the process industry running a low demand mode of operation and the certificate and the assessment was done with cycle testing or the B10 data point or higher continuous demand application for machinery or robotics that would be something that you would want a piece of information that you'd want to know and it would not be applicable for your industry so that's always a good thing to look at in the assessment report underneath that um, is the safety manual and that's going to be the document number or document name of the manufacturer's safety manual and it's going to include any certification restrictions whether that's environmental or the restrictions on the safety function in the safety manual IEC 61508 has a bunch of different requirements that must be in the safety manual so whenever we do a certification we go through and look at the product safety manual and make sure that all the requirements are being met and the safety manual might be combined with the IOM of a product especially if it's a simple mechanical or type A device um, the safety manual might have more in it than just the requirements of the standard and that's fine as long as the requirements of the standard are met in the safety manual and the safety manual um, that's going to be provided or issued by the manufacturer themselves it will either be on their website or maybe it's going to be folded up and put in the box and shipped out with the device um, 
the standard doesn't say how the information gets to the client. It just says it must get to the client some way. And if you don't know how the information is going to be conveyed to you, or you need the information beforehand, always ask. If you ask the manufacturer, they should have their safety manual readily available to hand to you at any time. So now you know the different parts of the certificate. Let's look at a few examples. Here's the first example. Let's see if I can get the highlighter working. There we go. So let's take a look at some things that we are talking about. So this is a reverse current valve and air cylinder. It has the company and the product. It's going to say what part of the standard it has been assessed to. You're going to have your systematic and your random capability along with the safety function and the application restrictions. As you can see, the application restrictions are saying there's different environments listed, there's different information, just look at the safety manual. It shows that this is a SIL-3 capable device. It's saying a revision and the release date along when the surveillance audit is due. As you can see down here, we have the ANSI stamp. Um, if you remember, there were two, an IAF and an ANSI stamp on the ones we looked at. That's because that is a brand new template. This was done earlier this year on an older template. So we did not have, um, it was still assessed to the same ANSI and IAF assessments, but we didn't include the IAF stamp on our template before. Um, we thought that many people were familiar with the ANSI um, logo, but we had some people ask us questions if ANSI was a part of the IAF, so now we are including both of those logos on the certificates. As you can see, we have two separate signatures on the certificate. Then we move to the back. We're going to have failure rates along with the assessment report number and the safety manual number. On our next certificate, this is brand new. It was just done at the end of May. So this is our new template. And as I said before, it either template is fine, they're both valid. We just changed how this looks at the bottom. This is a SIL-3 capable device, and you can see it has a revision and when the surveillance audit is due. It has the product, the manufacturer name, the systematic capability, along with the random capability. It's going to list the safety function, and it's going to say go to the safety manual for any application restrictions. You then have two separate signatures, both independent people signed off on it. Then on the back, you're going to have the different devices that were a part of this family, along with their failure rates. And then finally, the assessment report number and the safety manual number. Then we have our last example. We're going to take a look at, we have our um, product and manufacturer, systematic and random capabilities, you have the safety function and application restrictions. Once again, it says to see the safety manual, so that's something that they have to make available for you. It's an ANSI. Our logo is stamped on it. You can see SIL-3 capable, and it has a revision and it, it when it is valid until. It has two independent people sign off on it. Then you, we come to the back. For this, there were many different um, device configurations, and it would have gone way off the um, certificate table here. So we said for details, you can either look at Excellentia, or you can get the FMEDA report from the manufacturer itself. So that's something that you would have to call the manufacturer and they would be able to provide that information for you. 
Then underneath it, you have the assessment report and the safety manual. So there are many great things about being a worldwide recognized certification program. It's great being on top. It is awesome that both end users and manufacturers recognize the knowledge here at Exeter. The manufacturers realize that this is not just some rubber stamp program. This is something that it's a real achievement to receive this certification. But because of that, there's always a downside to success as well. Number one, not all manufacturers or all products pass. If one or both of the assessors don't agree that the product or the manufacturer has met the requirements, a certificate will not be issued. And also, there are a lot of, not a lot, but we have seen counterfeit certificates on the market. Here are just a couple examples of some certificates that we have seen counterfeit. On the leftmost and the rightmost, you can see they are old templates. Um, but in the middle, that looks very similar to our latest template that we have out. Um, so what do you do? How do you know if something is counterfeit or not? In I know for a fact one of these examples, the manufacturer had no idea this counterfeit um, certificate was out there. Um, some distributor wanted to sell more of these products and simply just photoshopped and slapped the name on the certificate. And so some counterfeit certificates us at Exida might not know are out there still. Some the manufacturers might not know are out there. So what do you do? Well, as I talked about the SAEL, that's the Safety Automation Element List. And we talked about how you can look at the different elements. You can search by the product name the manufacturer of the product. You can search by final elements. You can search by ball valves or if you need some sort of software requirement, anything you can search for. You can do advanced searches. And any up-to-date and current product that is certified is on our SAEL. So that's an easy way. It takes two minutes to pull up the website, do a quick search, and you can see the latest certificate and the assessment report and have that warm, fuzzy feeling that you're not going to use a counterfeit or artificial certificate. So now that you know all of that information, which we understand is a ton of information thrown out at you. What does that mean to you as an end user? Well, IEC 61508 and 511 is very specific. There are three, some people call them barriers, some people call them um, requirements, but only if you meet all three of the main requirements of the standard are you going to achieve complete compliance. So you might be doing two of these three very well, but if you're not looking at the third barrier or the third circle here, it's going to be all for nothing. So looking at the box in the certificate, first of all, the gray circle, SIL capability, that's going to be that systematic capability that we talked about. That's going to be the quality, the documents, the procedures, all of that information from that manufacturer. That's listed right in that systematic capability right here. Next, you're going to look at your architectural constraints and your probability of failure. That probability of failure is your PFD, so that probability of failure on demand. Once again, that's something that we say right here that that's normally controlled by the end user. But there are 
pieces of the information that are given to you by the certificate, such as the failure rate, so you can calculate the probability of failure. The safety manual is going to give you what the manufacturer suggests your proof test be. That doesn't mean you're going to actually do it that way or that often. So that's something that you're going to need to take into consideration when you're doing your calculations. And finally, architectural constraints. That is going to be how it's going to be routed in your system. Are you going to do a one out of two? Are you going to do a two out of three system? That is going to be um, considered in the architectural constraints. Once again, the manufacturers give you pieces of information to say how best you do your architecture constraints, but how you actually put it together is up to you. So, when you have your certificate, it gives you a lot of information, but there's still going to be some pieces that you're going to need to do yourself. At this time, I'm going to take any questions that you might have. Um, and if you think of any later, please feel free to um, email me. And these, Exeter Academy has some upcoming courses that we ha are holding, such as if you want in more information on functional safety analysis design and operation, we have a detailed in-depth course multiple times. We have our PHA and our LOPA and SRS along with SIL verification courses. If you want any more information at this, you can check out our training schedule. And if you have any ideas for webinars, always email them to us and we will take those ideas and hopefully make a webinar out of them. So at this point, I'm going to see what questions we have. Okay, the first question we received in SIL certification, what does the Route 1H or the Route 2H mean? Um, I believe we talked quickly about this, but we have webinars just on this topic if it's something that you're interested in. Um, Route 1H is following the safe failure fraction and the equation for that. Route 2H means that the components or the device has been shown in the field. It has field history. Um, that it is not brand new, never been tested before. Um, like I said, if you want more information, I believe we have blogs and webinars on our website. You can go through the exit of the resources tab has recorded and past webinars if you want more information on that. Um, the next question is, how long does it take for a new certificate data to be entered into Excellentia? Well, that depends. Um, there are two types of ways of doing Excellentia. You have the online version, which I believe it gets updated more often, but if you have the key, it, when you open it up, it asks if you want to um, update, there are updates, do you want to populate them? Some people, if they just want to quickly go through it, um, don't necessarily update those all the time. Those happen, those big push updates, I believe, happen um, quarterly. So once that push has happened, then you have the opportunity to um, get the latest and greatest information. Is systematic capability requirements in IEC 61 511 or 508 standard? Absolutely. Um, 61 511 states that the basically lets you know to look back at all of the requirements in 61 508 standard for systematic capability. Um, it is the quality 
the process, the procedures, the documents, the modification, all of that information is in that systematic capability. Um, you might see other times where it's not necessarily says systematic capability, it might say the systematic requirements or it's SC3. So that capable word might be throwing you off, but both of the standards definitely say that there are requirements for um, systematic capability. Is the material list by product type of Exeter certifications available to the public? Absolutely. You go to our, our website and then it's exeter.com slash SAEL and that will have all of the certificates that we have um, done along with other um, certification bodies as well. If the other certification body have um, released publicly the assessment report and stated how the product is being um, met all of the requirements and we are aware of it they are also listed on the SAEL. It's a great um, tool and we highly encourage end users to use that. It has a lot of great information on it. The next question is the assessment report and safety manual. Um, it has a question if they should be delivered um, documents by the vendor. Um, the standard does not say it has to be delivered. It has to be made available to anyone that has purchased the valve or the actuator or whatever device it is. I always let um, customers know that that could be if they go to the product website and there could be a link that you download the PDF of that safety manual. Um, the assessment report is always on the SAEL so you can always get that information. Um, the safety manual it can be delivered with the product itself. It can be on the website. It can be put together with the IOM and given to you as that document. But um, it has to be made available to you and the standard demands that, yes. Uh, the next question, how long is the typical certification process for Exeter from submitting new instrument to actually receiving the certificate? That is kind of a tricky question. Um, we have had products that uh, vendors get us involved when they're still developing the product and they might not have all of the verification and validation test results in yet but they send us the test plan and then once they have the results they send it in again. If it is something that everything is done, completed, um, they're not expecting any changes to be made, um, we can typically get it done within three to six months depending on if it is a process that the vendor has been through before. If they're new to functional safety, they might not know what needs to be in the safety manual. They might have never had an impact analysis. We've had times where we've received everything and a PO in the same day and everything is good to go and we can turn that around much quicker. It just depends on how much back and forth there is um, with the manufacturer and Exeter. Uh, what is the process to determine the cost for a product or the manufacturer system to be certified? Um, what we would do is we would say definitely contact us. We would first, there's a big difference if it's a type A or type B product. If it's a simple mechanical device, we obviously don't need to go through the coding and all of those requirements. So, and it depends if it's a single device or if it's a whole family of devices. So definitely get in contact with Exida. Um, you can send me an email and we will go through and have a phone conversation so we're on the same page and then we can get you a proposal. 
Uh, the next question is uh, the SILSAFE data check site that we showed only has right now valves, actuators, other final elements. Will more components be added? Yes. It started with only valves because we saw the bogus data in the valves. Then we started seeing those extremely low failure rates for actuators and then solenoids started creeping in. So as we are seeing more and more bogus um, failure rates, we will keep adding to the SillSafeData.com list. But right now, we mostly see the very, very, very dangerously low failure rates in the final element department. Um, and then finally, we have a, a very specific question. Um, if you would like, please feel free to email me and we can get in a more in-depth conversation about this later. Um, I think that's all the questions for now. Thank you so much for joining me and I appreciate all of the comments and questions and keep looking back for more Exeter webinars. Thank you.